Good morning. So, uh, I'd like to say then that this is a work in progress, and worse than that, that it is a fragment of a larger project. So it's, uh, it's really trying, I'm trying to make sense out of what I am working with and don't know exactly how to make full sense out of it. So here is one attempt. Um, Andrew, thank you for inviting us and including me in the project. He has asked us to tease out of the evidence of history by any means possible the voices of those voiceless people. I have to say, I understand subalternity, as this symposium sets out to address, to mean other than the theoretical framework established under the umbrella of post-colonial studies or the pro proletariat of the Gramscian Marxist approach. So I'm not looking at the proletariat, at, at the, when I say riffraff or the low lives or the working class, that's not the category I'm, uh, I have in mind. I don't know how else to put them, to be honest. In this case, the visual representations of the voiceless encompasses an array of people whose role in making things and doing useful tasks is actually situated, depicted, primarily in the context of the princely or elite environments, where the prince and the royal patron and their elite society enjoy the fruits of that labor. That's where the sources of information uh, basically lie, and that's how one can imagine pulling them out. So in this tile work, which is Safavid, by the way, and I'm, I'm not quite sure if I can be so precise as to stop at 1501, and I shall not. <laughs> Things flow, as you know. Um, but um, people like the, the attendants on the right-hand side uh, would be the kind of um, labor, if you will, that we see in such contexts as uh, princely gatherings, picnics, and so forth. Um, and in a painting, or paintings such as these, and again, uh, across that, that uh, dynastic border, if you will, a 15th century, late 15th century uh, page from a divan and of Jami, and that one which is a scene of Joseph enthroned from a falnome of 16th century date. In both of these, and in particular in this one, everyone you see, with the exception of a couple of major sort of elderly figures, are people who are cooking, serving, this guy is serving, uh, this one is pouring things into bowls that are ready in a, in a tray to be served. Those guys are tending to the big vats of food and, and soup and uh, animals hung from there on top. It's entirely about the kind of labor that we might call the food industry labor, so to speak. Um, so um, I want to consider these cast of characters in Persian painting or Persianate painting, uh, who uh, appear in primarily princely manuscripts. These were manuscripts made for uh, the elite, uh, and also uh, in context of princely entertainment of some sort or another, generally. They are depicted, as you see, in the act of cooking, rolling the dough into noodles. You, you actually see them mixing contents of pots, fanning the fire, uh, sometimes grilling a bird, uh, and indeed serving food. And they carry dishes to tables that are laden with these bottles and dishes. And, uh, and in general, these are the workers in the food industry, uh, to use a contemporary labor designation, which become, interestingly, increasingly visible in book paintings that start from the late and, and second half of the 15th century. So prior to that, I have been unable to really locate enough evidence to say that this was indeed a, uh, a, particular, uh, uh, a particularly visible group of images in book painting uh, until we see, we see them appearing in the later 15th century. 
Scholarship, however, sees them not, as it were. Uh, they tend to be understood in terms of uh, necessary pawns in making the princely subject matter come to life, actually. So in the end, we are more interested in knowing that that is Joseph enthroned uh, in an entertainment scene than, than knowing what is going on around uh, this scene. And, um, and of course, we always are uh, terribly logocentric. So the story comes from an iconography uh, that can be read by way of reading the text, usually. Um, so although they are seen as traceless, voiceless, nameless people in such courtly contexts, I want to suggest that their very presence and the increasing diversity of the types of people, types of activities that are being represented in these paintings signal the trace or residu <clears throat> residual evidence of the kind of social situatedness of their activities and their personhood that uh, carry more agency than um, we seem to have suspected. Um, I don't know exactly how this can be completely fleshed out, but evidence says that something is going on here. And if we see them alongside all other kinds of evidence, written, pictured, uh, and especially in regards to cooking and serving of food, uh, but also alongside vessels of uh, vessels and instruments of making, uh, serving, and consuming of food and drinks, that is, dishes, cups, uh, bottles, and the like. Together, they seem to yield uh, some observations worth making on the significant role that was played by such working persons. And in this case, maybe one can call them the subaltern here. So. This um, little fragment that I discussed today, and I really hope that it can be a, an opportunity for me to hear comments and suggestions, is really part of a larger project which I'm conceptualizing as something like culinary culture as visual knowledge. It has a number of different uh, fragments, or not fragments, but eventually, and in my head, it will be a whole at some point. Uh, so, um, these people, uh, I'm sorry that these are uh, not terribly excellent slides and then they are washed out on top of it. Uh, they are not, in other words, so much voiceless and invisible. Here, for instance, the story of Homai and Homayun, or Farhad and Shirin, uh, always is told by way of the main figures, or this is uh, uh, the, the, um, the Chinese emperor. Uh, it's, it's not the musicians, the guy who brings the bottle of wine, the one who is kneeling here with a, with a tray of stuff in it. Uh, but, and, and we can't tell the story from their angle, but what I'm suggesting is that we can pull them out of this anonymous scene to create some other cluster of knowledge that surrounds the activities related to food and entertainment. Um, so um, the very fact that we can even see them, in other words, across time, is made possible by their very condition of subalternity, subalternity so to speak. So in the representational realm of paintings and objects and I would add buildings in this. Uh, the traces of the builder, the potter, the painter, the metal worker, the weaver, these are not dependent, shouldn't be understood to be dependent only on a signature on the work, but rather the very trace, the hand of the maker is embedded in the fabric of that thing that was made. And that's where they rest. In other words, to pull them out of that, to tease that out of the very fabric is particularly important. We, are, we tend to be more uh, hung up on the signatures. And if there are no signatures, 
we assume there's no agency, that these are anonymous craftsmen in the midst of masses of craftsmen and, and builders and so forth without any particular presence in a social context. Uh, so for instance, Janaid's signature in this case is indeed present but hidden in a small corner. This hiding of themselves in the paintings is also a very important part of it. So uh, contrary to the way in which we have tended to give higher social ranks also to the arts of the world of Islam, uh, in that word is given the highest ranking, so anything written, calligraphic, uh, is uh, above everything else, it makes all the rest of them uh, in the category of crafts, voicelessly understood crafts. Um, and that same materiality of the artist's touch or the residual presence of the artist, even if there is no signature, must be the point to constitute the agency of these craftsmen. And I bring here a mismatched pair, a cooking pot, tin cooking pot from the Timorid period and this great courtauld bag, uh, which is in the courtauld gallery, hence courtauld bag, which I invite you to come and see it. It's on view, it's fantastic. No signature on either of these. But in both cases, the very presence of the craftsmen, artists, uh, is embedded in the fabric, in other words, of the work. This indeed is a larger topic that can be dealt here. But to point to the, the idea, I want to point to a specific example to note the fact that in searching for the voice or trace of the seemingly voiceless, it seems to me that our research methods and construction of hierarchies in cultural terms have actually not helped much. So here I'm really speaking for art history in particular, where the hierarchies in the arts are constructed along uh, fairly rigid formulas with the calligrapher on top of everything else. And indeed, it is a logocentric historical method of investigation, which I think we all suffer from. I invite you to look at pictures more. Um, so the potter, the weaver, metal worker, and the like are the craftsmen, the bottom line of that. And architects, actually, are not even architects from what, what we know. Uh, from a very Eurocentric definition of the term, Unless, of course, we are in Sinan territory. That's a different matter. Uh, these are building professionals, understood to be entirely subsumed in, in this kind of a mass of people who carry dirt and put bricks on top of bricks and so forth. So the example that I wanted to just very briefly point out to as a matter of a methodological issue is that that of the uh, mosque of Gohashad in the shrine of Imam Reza in Mashhad, which uh, I hope that if you haven't seen, the next chance you have to be in Mashhad, you can conceal or, or, or manage to go and see it. There, there are a pair of epigraphic panels uh, in mosaic faience that are on either side of the Avon uh, cover, and this one is the one that is on the left-hand side of it. Um, and um, as far as I know, these are the er this one is the earliest example of an archi architect's signature, or if you will, mark of his claim to the building, because he doesn't literally sign the building, but it's a mark of his uh, presence there. In the entire history of the Islamicate and Persianate context, maybe, Professor Hillenbrand can correct me on this one, but I think it is truly an extraordinary instance of it. Uh, one of the panels on the right states the date of the completion of the building in 1418. The other one, which is the one that you see here, says that the work, uh, this is the work of the poor weak slave who needs the mercy of the compassionate ruler, Qawamiddin ibn Zainuddin Shirazi, at Tayyan, the plaster mason. Irrespective of the historical, there, there is his, the panel that spells out uh, his involvement. 
irrespective of the historical weight of this building um, and the project in general, which is quite substantial, the very presence of Ghavameddin's name, even if we don't call it a signature, is extraordinary for any time before the 16th century architects where we begin to see names appearing on foundation inscriptions. And in particular, this is very much a Persianate practice, I must say. This is not just a, a, an Islamic practice. We really find this one in a Persianate context. There are indeed very little uh, written material, references to named architects uh, also, in the case of Ghavameddin, however, we actually have some tidbits. Uh, they are very small but important, and they might tell us with regard to the social standing and thus the voice, voice or voice, voiced or voicelessness of the makers of things, such as a builder, an architect, whatever we call them. And, and there is something about this. Uh, I'll, I'll at least briefly mention it. Dolacho Samargandi, the author of Tazkirat al um, completed in 1487, refers to Ghavameddin as one of the four luminaries of the court. And he calls him a master in Mahandesi, engineering and geometry, tarrohi, design or drawing, and memori, architecture or building. It's, in other words, it's not just one title, one skill that also seems to be at work here. And yet, despite all of this evidence and the personal mark on, of Ghavameddin on the building itself, it has rarely counted in, uh, in scholarship as the social place or site of uh, agency of the architect. In this case, he truly is an architect in the sense that we understand it, and not just a craftsman. But he identifies himself as the plaster mason at Tayyan, and not the ostad in all those other things for which he was very well known. In so doing, he underscores signals, really, for us too, the cultural significance of constructing one's own social value system, or one's own place in the social value system, systems and hierarchies of status. In other words, that they don't sign, or that they sign by uh, self-deprecating titles does not necessarily indicate that they are invisible from a social point of view. So it's really worth making a case here also of the fact that it is in these late 15th century book paintings that we see for the first time really the building professions depicted in the guise of workers on site actually. In these cases, it's, uh, uh, both of them are attributed to Behzad and has the construction of Havana and the great mosque of Timur in Samarkand being depicted through the labor that is put in on site actually, masons, bricklayers, plasterers, just about anyone <coughs> that we might now call Amal Banna. This is indeed a 15th century phenomenon and it comes with the evidence of people like Ghavameddin but primarily through this latter part of the 15th century with a depiction of the subaltern in, uh, in what might be clearly understood to be the urban working people in the employ of elegant court patrons. It is also evidenced in a number of other contexts, grave diggers. You can see them in the left-hand side picture with the top part of it. The story of, uh, it comes from Mantarotero Vatar, and we look at these things and delight, of course, in the very, um, the very sort of naturalistic, attention to naturalistic detail, to uh, uh, these uh, uh, fragments and vignettes of daily life. We consider them as the great genius of Behzad to have, to have introduced such uh, items, um, and, and indeed to the context of patronage, Sultan Hussein Baigara and 
all of that come into play. But we don't look at the workers, so to speak, as evidence for something else. So here, what you have is indeed the staff of the hammam, including Dallok and the guy who shaves the head. And here, the head of no less than Harun al-Rashid is at stake. Um, so all are part of the repertoire of people who are not the rulers, the princes, the heroes, but the urban crafts and artisan classes, basically. Their presence, however, seems to be uh, largely invisible as far as what it can and might say with regards to the social context of service. And of course, this subject has to take into account the economy of all of this. In other words, where does the fund come for this to take place? How is it generated? What are the structures of the, of the gathering of such people and so forth? Um, I promised food and cooking and cooked uh, sort of the riffraff of the, of the uh, cooking staff, but um, that I wanted to put in the context of this larger sort of construction, if you will, in the latter part of the 15th century of the, uh, the people who do things, make things, rather than be the subject of uh, a heroic subject matter, or a romantic subject matter, or a mystical, uh, didactic uh, idea in a, in a manuscript. Um, and in, it is really worth making that point about the fact that these are not, um, as I am going to cross borders, if I may, these are not restricted to a Timorid context, but actually begin in this late uh, part of the 15th century to gather evidence in larger numbers and explode in some ways in the 16th century and uh, further into 17th century. Uh, but what I want to point out, and I want to use this one, the painting, uh, very well-known painting uh, of a school scene, and I'm gonna use this uh, as a way of pointing to things. The, it's a school scene, actually, with the teacher and a boy being bastinadoed here. Uh, but I don't care about that so much as here down below where these young boys with a master are in the process of uh, dipping paper into a vat of pigments and hanging it up to dry. Uh, and then on this end, there's a little boy who helps the man with, with his wuzu. Uh, and then further up here, a cooking scene in which uh, dough is being rolled, uh, a pot of soup is on fire, and in other words, a, a sort of a cohesive, seemingly irrelevant, but cohesive sense of a daily life in which these people are party to the making of that daily life possible, actually. The pictorial tendency to depict in greater detail and with people filling in and fitting to the context of a scene, an episode, or particularly well-loved subject of the literary canon is on full display in, pulp, in, in uh, painting, uh, book painting, of this uh, latter part of the 15th century and indeed later on in the 16th century. Here, however, food making processes and cooking staff are taking ascendancy actually. Let me go back to the previous one, oops, because there seem to be a real presence. Clusters of people shown in the act, detailed uh, depiction in the act of preparation of food uh, are indeed large, in large numbers in manuscripts that come out of the royal katabhanas. And given the hierarchies in social standing or social power relations, if you will, um, where the painter or the cook would be considered as a, as a much lower uh, cultural visibility uh, uh, zone in, in this regard, the visual richness of the evidence runs contrary to it. It's really in a different direction. It's asking us to look closer, to see the riffraff, so to speak. 
to hear these voices that are so much harder to hear through the written words. And I'm hoping and, and very much looking forward to, um, to the talks over the course of these two days that I um, am assuming will bring out the written word more fully to the foreground. Um, this sort of evidence um, is really non of the non-literate. I'm glad that um, Andrew mentioned this one, um, that it's a non-literate community. Or better put, this is um, people who do not write by profession. So they're not the poets, the munchi, the scribe, the, the historian, for instance. And yet, their presence is quite powerfully visible. Uh, what is so also uh, curious about this is that in the, this late um, Timorid art, if I may call it Timorid, late 15th century, the visibility of the subaltern and their social role in these laborers, artisans, and so forth, goes hand in hand with the gradual emergence. It seems to me to be gradual, but maybe somebody can correct me on that. Emergence of manuals, how to do manuals, actually. The how to do manuals that particularly relate to uh, certain kinds of crafts. So there is no manual on hammam operations. That doesn't, that I don't know of. Uh, I don't know of any that is a manual for builders. But we do have manual on, uh, on agriculture, Eshad uh, Zara'a. Um, again, thought to be written for a, a, a nouveau riche, somebody coming after the Timorids collapse and wants to know how to do gardening and, and plant uh, trees and so forth. But the very fact of gathering the kind of information that is based on practical knowledge of those who do it, the gardener, the, uh, uh, the farmer, and so forth, runs also together with at least one manual of cookery that comes at the early 16th century. And one has to imagine that manuals come about as a result of a large body of information that needs to be collated and gathered. So they are not just suddenly, I like to write a manual, but there is a particular purposefulness to it, which is part of the, the other parts of this project. And then, of course, there is a manual for art that comes out also in the 16th century. Uh, so it is uh, these parallels of the cookbooks, uh, manual of art, manual of gardening and, and uh, farming, and so forth, that go hand in hand with these depictions of farmers and gardeners and builders and hammam workers and cooks and cooking service industry. So this has made me chase after whether and how representations of eating, food, cooking, and objects themselves may have triggered uh, the interest in the transmission of culinary knowledge from the practitioner's side to a larger community or an illiterate community, if you will. And that the objects themselves, those things that serve food and make food in them, may have triggered the interest in this transmission of a culinary knowledge, which should be seen as a category similar to literary knowledge. This is something Bert Fragner has suggested uh, in terms of cookbooks as, as literary genre. But I want to take that idea together with representations of food and cooking and the vessels of eating and drinking to suggest that this visual material phenomenon complements, um, disseminates, or even codifies the uh, popularization, makes possible the popular popularization of that knowledge. And it's directly related to the practitioners, to the makers, to the ones who do these things. The subject has also take, taken me to consideration of ways in which such proliferation in the pictorial and written depictions of food and food things and people 
uh, may have triggered translation further on in conceptual terms from seeing to tasting or to a perception of beauty in terms of taste buds. Uh, so that's a very different sort of a, a dimension of this uh, project. And in that, we are talking about the agency of a number of uh, uh, groups of people in which the, the con construction of a sense of taste is between gustatory and the visual, actually. Uh, and even uh, other senses are Im uh, implicated in that. Um, oops, I meant to go to this one. Um, Persian food practices. I hesitate to call it Persianate food practices, as it seems kind of funny to, <laughs> to call it Persianate for everything, but forgive me for that. Um, these practices, despite their distinctive habits and preferences and their impressive longevity, and this is really impressive longevity, is still much a, a footnote in the scholarship on cookery in Islam. Abbasids get a lot because of that thick book, of course, and Ottoman culinary arts have uh, attracted attention. Uh, of course, the publication of two Safavi cookery treatises by the late and the great Iraj Afshar uh, are major uh, events for us. The earlier of the two fit well with what I was suggesting here, uh, which is that rise in late 15th century of pictorial rendering of the crafts of cooking. And in this case, uh, it's increased currency alongside the writing of relevant treatises in the early 16th century. Uh, and these are the most important for my purposes for this particular context is the Karname dar bab e tab which is dated 927, 1521. And this, this was written by Hajj Muhammad Ali Bavachi Baghdadi, a manuscript which is in the Tehran University Library. It belongs to the time of Shah Ismail, but the cook was associated with a princely household. Um, and, and the cook, Hajj Muhammad Ali Bavachi Baghdadi, uh, should be understood, although we don't know much about him, but should be understood as hardly a voiceless or anonymous craftsman, as his text indeed runs parallel to some of these other uh, representations of and, and um, presentations of the craft of cooking, if you will. The other one, by the way, which is much more exaggerated, has a different place in my research, is the one by Nurullah, Nurullah Oshpaz, he was the cook for Shah Abbas and um, Shah Abbas the first, Madat al Hayat Rasali dar ilm Tabakhi, and also very rich for this uh, material that I'm working on. Uh, whether we are looking at the cookbook or art object or painting depictions, they seem to be visual mediations in the processes of making that kind of culinary knowledge. The evidence, um, uh, I think, uh, let me see if I have my... Um, I am above it. Did we start on time? Well, no, we didn't. Okay, can I... I don't want to cut you off because it's too cool. <laughs> Yay, thank you. I want some five minutes, five minutes into it. I'll, I'll jump forward. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that although uh, many of the scenes are picnic scenes, outdoor scenes, but the idea should be understood in urban context. It's entirely productive of that kind of an urban context. So I'll, I'll leave that outside of this. And there is something else that I'm going to leave and move forward with this, which is on the question of actually the objects. The objects fit into this. So the picture is much more multi-sensory, multi-dimensional, um, um, intermedial uh, kind of a thing in that you really need to look at them together. For instance, it is not, Persian cooking is not the same as Ottoman cooking in this period. And the dishes tell us that these are different has to do with rice in large part. And I want to at least finish by pointing to that 
fact that uh, there are more diversity of forms of dishes in the Safavid context of survival of this stuff than, say, the Ottoman one. And greater number of them relate to the particularity of the way in which food was made and served. How it was served is a very important part of this uh, discussion. So that becomes an important thing with regards to the voiceless, if you will. Uh, from that uh, uh, treatise of Hajj Muhammad Ali Bawachi Baghdadi, uh, what we learn that for a rice dish called siyah polo, uh, he says, Berenjer rangin kud dar paye u bayad nahad, means a dish, a large, he says actually it has to be a large dish. Baghye masaleh ra pahlui yek digar bayad gojand. In other words, he specifies the method of composing the cooked portions of the dish on the platter. And then he says that the platter should be topped by a large domical lid. The domical lid is sitting around here, waiting to be put on the dish. And the whole thing to be carried to the souffre so carefully that nothing would move out of place. And then he says, Add, he adds that the person who cooked the dish must serve it, as he alone knows how he has placed the different components of the dish together. So here, that professional hand agency is one that remains very much active throughout the whole thing. So he, the discussions in these cookbooks about how you put it together and how you serve the, the food points to that kind of a specialization of a category of workers who happen to be also appearing in paintings in greater uh, currency at this time. I'm going to jump forward. So uh, this is not this kind of degree of culinary refinement and the way in which the cooks talk about their, uh, their particular craft is not just a matter of courtly practice, but as may be suggested from those proliferation of pictorial concerns with food, cooking, eating parties from this late 15th century date onwards, something of a greater dissemination of the interest, uh, not only in the food and food stuff, which I am working on, but also on the working staff in a social armature seems to be uh, to be emerged. And this goes hand in hand with those other kinds of manuals. And in a way, they seem to be self consciously indicating what the artist, what the cook, what the uh, various practitioners, the artisans' uh, uh, engagement is, what the contribution is in all of these. So, evidence as I read it, and even Rostam gets into cooking. Uh, in this context, he is grilling um, um, an onager, a wild ass. Uh, so as I read it, it seems to point in the direction of a collective wish to pr preserve, transmit knowledge at popularizing levels of intent that we haven't seen until this late 15th century, early 16th century in the Iranian world or the Persian context. Uh, I'm aware of the one of the uh, Nematullah cookbook, by the way, which is Sultanate, but, but let's just leave it as it's a unique example, and, and I'm going to leave it aside for now. Cooks and artists, just as poets and historians, worked for the Shah and the elite, uh, but they have been actually making all kinds of kitchen noise as well. That's it. Thank you. Sorry if I went over. Oh, right, uh, questions and discussion points from from the floor. And I've got a, a microphone, so you, your voices will be preserved for posterity. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll come around. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks to some for that. It was <clears throat> fantastic and, and, and um, raises a lot of questions. So the thing that uh, what struck me most, which I probably haven't. Um, looked at these things this way before, is that I mean, you, you referred to the, the sort of hierarchy of, of spaces in the images with the 
sort of the, the center being that of the prince or the master, or whatever, and the, all this other stuff's going on, which we've kind of uh, many of us have ignored before. Um, one of the, the things that that I noticed here that you didn't uh, mention, but I think you were implying, is that that actually what's going on in the center is very static and still, but what's going on in the peripheries, particularly in the foreground and the rear ground, is 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 very much in motion. I mean, there's <laughs> all of the details really. It's, I mean, the painters were, were putting, it seems, largely their efforts into what was going on yeah. in the periphery, depicting detail, maybe transmitting a certain kind of knowledge. Um, but I was trying to, to, dis, to discern as I was looking at these, at these images whether or not it's just everything going on in the periphery is, is equally important or whether or not there's a sort of hierarchy um, in the spaces around, in the, in the foreground, in the rear ground, and in the wings. Is, have you been able to discern whether or not there's a certain choreography of viewing these that we should be looking... I mean, obviously what's in the center is, is the highest um, sort of, uh, well, we've read it as the highest, right. but, but how are we to read the other sections? Is, is exactly what we read is the highest. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very, very um, uh, uh, sharp observation and, and one who obviously has looked at paintings. We actually do, I think there is a problem in looking at these paintings with a title on the bottom to begin with, so that the title drives the way we look at them. And we tend to think of an iconographic category into which it fits. Um, in great many of them, and this cannot be just about these painting it, the paintings. It has to be in the context of how the visual uh, strategies change, for instance. So when we are looking at, say, Ilhani Chahnameh's uh, earlier in 14th century, it's very clear to us that there is a very primary uh, subject matter to be told, and that is depicted with absolute economy, so you don't have all kinds of doodads around. When we get to this later period, you have a richer environment. But, but the one thing that we need to do, I think this is part of how sort of looking at Persian painting, teaching about how to look about, at, at Persian painting needs to consider is that they're not linear. That there is no structure that is linear or guides your eyes like a one point perspective is absent. So you don't have, you don't even have this foreground, middle ground, background idea even though it's there implicitly. But the eye is capable of roaming a bit more freely. But you're right, the primary subject is made big and central, and it is static. And without the surrounding, that is just Yusuf sitting on the throne. With the surrounding, now Yusuf is in late 15th century Herat, or early 17th, 16th century Tabriz. So the painters are really taking the codes and refashioning them into a, a new narrative in many ways. And I think that's how both the eye should move around, but also the reading of the, of the picture, if I may use that terrible term for it, uh, should be much more uh, free in terms of there's not a linear story of I go from this to that, there is the center and then the periphery. So that would be the way I would go about it. But thank you for that observation. Uh, Jennifer and then Robert. Yeah. A quick question since we want to move on. Do you need the microphone? Yes. Or can you hear me without? No, it's for TV. Oh, <laughs> I can't live with you, Andrew. But I have to get time to Well, first of all, Susan, thank you for a lucid, stunning presentation and also for drawing attention to material culture which I have long fought for. <laughs> and as a museum curator, I've spent much of my life cataloguing, analyzing, adapting, using it in my own written work. Um, I'll talk to you obviously more detail later, but I'm sure you know of Nora Titley's great work in which she went through every possible Persian painting and analyzed them according to the subjects, the objects, the people who made them, 
uh, I've always found it very useful. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And a lot of Safavid pottery, um, I've noticed in our collection, the National Museum's collections, there's often traces <laughs> of the fat and the oil that would have yes. been used in making a delicious rice dish. And also in the museum, I always made sure when I displayed material to group them according to a possible function. Yes. No, it's true. Yeah. What I'm suggesting actually is, and this is absolutely true and it's really important what you're pointing out, what I'm suggesting is that not just what their function was, but to look at them in comparative context where you see, for instance, Ottoman ceramics do not have those white platters that exist in Safavid context. We ju just simply say it's because they do rice dishes, but it is more than that. It's part of this whole sort of culinary culture, if you will. They make more mezzo than rice, you see. Yes. So many stains on the there's so much in this paper and I'd love to talk to you about it later but um, one observation and one question first of all uh, most of these lowlifes seem to be dressed by Armani <laughs> <laughs> it's true and, and if, you, if you look at what um, poor people in traditional uh, can I Iran, bring a lowlife in a in a in a Armani outfit up. I think I love this. First of all, the hammam guys are not Armani guys, but these guys are good. Indeed. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and a piece of evidence in that direction is the use of color. Mm -hmm. Very bright color, all sorts of bright colors, mm -hmm. which are used by the painter to, uh, to do things with the comp composition right. and to link different parts of the composition. Right. They are not uh, realistic. Yeah. Uh, you 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 would expect people who are so poor to wear undyed garments. Yeah. And I'm sure that's what they wore. That's yeah. an observation. The other is is to do with how these these images are put together, and what you see in the way of the sudden explosion of the common man in late mm -hmm. Timurid painting is a hijacking of standard iconography. We get scenes that have never been depicted before. Yeah. And that frees the painter to do all sorts of things. It's, it's a different matter from showing a central Yusuf surrounded by courtiers who happen to be um, rolling dough or whatever they might be doing. It's choosing completely new uh, iconography and populating it with uh, people that weren't depicted before, fishermen, woodcutters, yeah. uh, as, 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 as you were saying. So it has to do with a new attitude to space, with a new attitude to, to the world. You've done so much work on drawings, you will know that there are no preparatory drawings for these, for these things, so that we're not looking at a detailed knowledge of the human body which has been laboriously acquired by close observation. We're looking at stereotype poses. These, these people all look like action men, mm -hmm. you know, with, 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 with jointed, jointed limbs. Yeah. They're, they're, they're like Spider-Man. They're not, they're they're not human beings. <laughs> uh, so, it's, it's, it's nature, maybe, but it's nature methodized. Yes, but that's not a, that's, is that, are you, are you thinking, I'm not sure if I understand what you're, is that a, a critique of what the observation of the daily life might mean, actually, in these contexts? In other words, uh, what I don't know is what you're, what you're getting at. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting at the uh, presence of these uh, low lives has to do with a new iconography, yeah. with a new attitude to pictorial space. Yeah. And that is uh, forcing the painter to look in a totally different way at uh, the world that he's depicting from his predecessors. Right. So it's not just that you get lots of, lots of people doing serving food or, or building buildings but rather that you get a new iconography that uh, either unfamiliar texts are used 
or familiar texts are, uh, are used in ways that they were never used before. Right. New, new uh, elements from the So are you texts. privileging iconography in terms of top-down imposition of a new, um, a, a new desire for different things? Or is this possible to be open, which is what I'm suggesting here, no, I think that it is it's open. possible to be open towards new ways of thinking about the social context more broadly. It's not without the presence of the ruler and, you know, we still have the, the images of the central princely character in there. But it is also uh, opening up to these. But what I'm not quite sure about is if the iconography somehow has a privileged position in social <coughs> conditions of making of these manuscripts. Is this some, something that comes, are you suggesting it comes from the patron side into the courtly Ketabhane production? No, I, don't think, or, I, I yeah. think it comes it comes from underneath. Yeah. And once you've made the decision to look at a familiar text and instead of illustrating the familiar subjects, to illustrate an unfamiliar subject, you are on your own. Yes, but even what I'm suggesting <laughs> is that even when the familiar subject is being depicted, now you have a much more crowded world than we what we, we had before. Yes, that becomes part of this whole... So I'm not... I'll, I'll I'm think not a bit about it. No, yeah. no, I think, I think but I want to know how, how you're seeing it so that I can refine. Sorry. Terrific. That's really great. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.